Gloria Gaynor has been hailed the Queen of Disco, and for good reason. In 1978, she catapulted a B-side single to unimaginable stardom, creating a legendary track that has inspired generations of listeners. To this day, I Will Survive remains a dominant anthem of resilience for communities and individuals who turn to it for its empowering strength and courage. Hello there, it's Warren Hewitt here. I hope you're doing marvelously well. Welcome back to another episode in the series. If you haven't already, please subscribe. And if you hit the notification bell, you'll be notified when we have a new video. And if you're into production, you can go to producelikeapro.com, sign up for the email list and get a whole bunch of free goodies. Born Gloria Foles in Newark, New Jersey in 1943, Gloria Gaynor grew up surrounded by music. Gloria began singing around Newark and was introduced to Johnny Nash while singing at the Orbit Club. Nash became one of her first mentors and encouraged her to begin writing songs and to choose a stage name. Gloria explained in her autobiography, the name Gloria Gaynor came from Johnny Nash. My real name was Gloria Foles. But Johnny said, this is not a stage name. There is no way you can use that name. Why don't you choose a name that starts with G so people will call you Gigi? It will stick. It will be like a little affectionate nickname. Gaynor was the first name that popped into his head and she stuck with it. Nash also brought her into his record company, Jossida, which was named for his family who ran it. Johnny, Sissy, his wife, and Danny, his brother-in-law. In 1973, Gloria was signed to Columbia Records, but found little success there. Her first big hit came with MGM with a 1975 album, Never Can Say Goodbye, which very memorably placed the first three songs and the album singles without any breaks between the tracks, essentially creating a massive 19-minute dance song medley to kick off the album. Gloria was gaining a reputation as one of the key players in disco music and released four more albums in a few short years. Experience Gloria Gaynor 1975, I've Got You 1976, Glorious 1977, Gloria Gaynor's Park Avenue Sound 1978, but it was a song from a sixth album that took her from a successful disco artist into iconic star status, cementing her legacy in the history of popular music. And that song was I Will Survive. To understand the full meaning behind the song, we not only have to look at the incredible performance captured in the recording, but also its history and songwriting. The song was written by Freddie Perrin and Dino Fakaris. Prior to their work with Gaynor, Perrin and Fakaris had both worked for Motown Records. Perrin had been a part of Barry Gordy's collection of songwriters and producers who were specifically working to create hits for the Jackson 5. Fakaris had worked with Rare Earth, including on their hit, I Just Want to Celebrate. By 1978, both had parted ways with Motown. Perrin had established himself as a record producer, creating hit tracks for groups like Peaches and Herb out of his own professional recording studio in Los Angeles, the Mum and Pops company store. Engineer Jack Robin explained that Perrin had created an ideal environment for producing hit records, beginning with really good equipment, including a Harrison 32, the same board that Thriller was recorded and mixed on, a 3M24 track, plenty of good mics, and some nice outboard gear. There were two echo chambers and offices upstairs, and he had his group of A-team musicians, James Gadson, who was one of the premier R&B drummers, Scotty Edwards and Eddie Watkins were bass players, Melvin Wawa Ragan on guitar, Paulino da Costa on percussion, and Freddie himself or John Barnes on keyboards. In mid-1978, Polydor Records approached Perrin to produce a new track for Gloria Gaynor called Substitute. Needing a B-side for the track, Perrin brought in Fakaris, who had become one of his regular writing partners. Fakaris wrote most of the lyrics drawing on his experiences losing his job at Motown and struggling as an unemployed songwriter. He recalled, They let me go after almost seven years. I was an unemployed songwriter contemplating my fate. I turned the TV on and there it was. A song I had written for a movie theme titled Generation was playing right then. I took that as an omen that things were going to work out for me. I remember jumping up and down on the bed saying, I'm going to make it. I'm going to be a songwriter. I will survive. It was that empowering spirit that resonated with so many people, including Gloria, 
The first time she saw the lyrics, they were scribbled on the back of a torn brown paper bag. Not having them on hand, Fakaris had quickly written them down from memory for Gloria to see, and she was immediately struck by their impact. Substitute may have been the original vision for a hit A-side track, but Gloria's team immediately began making plans for I Will Survive to become the signature song at the end of her live performances. Before we get into those empowering lyrics, let's look at the music behind them. Like every great disco song, I Will Survive boasts a fantastic percussive bass groove. Drums on the track were played by James Gadsom, with Paul Hino da Costa credited for percussion. All three were regulars at Mum and Pops. Perrin would often call on them to record. The conga part especially adds the danceable groove that these elements create together. So here's the conga. Obviously the hat. Kick. Overhead. The snare. What a groove. What an amazing groove. Throw in the bass. Oh, yeah. amazing. The four on the floor groove with just the kick going the whole time. Just There's a little bit of a swing in there which really is exemplified by that bass. It's just got this continuous rolling movement. The whole song is just a freight train of just groovaliciousness. Absolutely incredible. On the drum recording, Ruben recalls that he'd likely use Sennheiser 421s on the kick or an AKG D112. The hat was a Neumann KM84. I suppose it could be other 421s on the rest of the kit or maybe 57s. Pretty standard stuff, but absolutely fantastic. The guitars on the track are credited to Bob Boogie Bowles and Melvin Wawa Watson Raggan. Raggan was also a regular at Mom and Pops. Bowles was in town at the time and brought into play for the sessions. He played the guitar lines you hear on the iconic opening intro alongside the piano and Gloria's expressive opening lines. This must be Bobby here. And this is Wawa here. I mean, it's got to be a DI. It just sounds like a guitar going straight into the console. It's cleaner than a clean thing on National Clean Day. Throw in the bass. Now there's some width in that tuning, shall we say. It's not like absolutely perfect.
Ruben recalls that in the short week that they had to put together both the A and B sides of the single, most of the time was spent on substitute. Most of the tracks for I Will Survive were recorded in just about two days with guitars, keyboards, drums, percussion and bass on the first day and Dave Bloomberg's string and horn parts on the second. Bowles also recalled a quick recording session for the song, especially since, as the B-side, musicians didn't expect it would get much playtime. Bowles explained, When we played the arrangement for I Will Survive, everyone was relaxed and had the attitude that the song wouldn't get any airplay anywhere. Now, that's pretty hilarious. It's, it's, you know, it's such an iconic song. Hard to think of you know, what would have gone through their minds, but I remember when I was making records as a musician, they would always pick the singles first and the, the producer would spend all the time on those two or three songs that were singles and then just kind of phone in the rest of the album. And it wasn't just that um, the rest of the songs didn't get any kind of love. You just kind of played your parts and, you know, interacted and did your best, but you didn't spend ages overthinking it and redoing stuff. And maybe that's why this is so successful, that it's just performances and grooves. But these strings are so good. horns as well. So good. A typical string session at the time was probably about 10 to 12 violins, four violas, four cellos on one mic for every couple of instruments, all submixed to two tracks. All of these parts together created a fantastic dance groove, but it was Gloria's incredible performance of those empowering lyrics, which really took the song to a legendary height. All right, let's check out the vocal. Strings and horns, band, phenomenal. But it does take an incredible singer to sell it, doesn't it? But then I spent so many nights thinking how you did me wrong, and I grew strong. Unbelievable. Gloria's vocals are incredible. Unrelenting. It's just like, just completely moving forward, just hitting on every syllable. So much momentum. It feels like one take. You almost feel her catching her breath between lines. I wouldn't be surprised if it was a take or, you know, two or three takes that are comp to one, but all complete takes, not line by line or syllable by syllable. Ruben recalls that it was an AKG 414 for the vocals. He says, I found this LA4A compressor limiter and I also used one of the chambers. There were two, a short chamber or a long chamber. And for this song, I remember picking the long chamber. Early in the vocal sessions, Ruben had recorded glorious practice sessions, never intending to actually use them. However, after a full day of recording, Gloria was struggling with back pain from spine surgery and couldn't come back to finish the sessions. At that time, they only had two verses and two choruses that they were really content with. However, after going back through all of the practice session recordings, they were able to fill in the rest of the song with those performances. In particular, they went with the very last practice take, which actually resulted in an almost complete performance of the song. The story about Gloria's back pain during the recording also connects with her own personal interpretation of the song's lyrics. After an on-stage accident at New York's Beacon Theatre in 1978, Gloria woke up the next morning paralyzed from the waist down. After a painful recovery from spine surgery, she was still wearing a back brace at the time of recording I Will Survive. She writes in her autobiography, Whenever I sang I Will Survive at the time, I was relating it to me recovering from my surgery. The word was going around after my accident that the queen of disco is dead. So one of my main thoughts was that my career would now survive. And in a funny way also, it felt as though it had to do with surviving the death of my mother. I know the song is about abusive relationships and women asserting their independence from men. And for most, that's what they identify with. I have suffered in that way myself, of course, but for some reason, I never think of that when I sing it. And that is perhaps what makes this song so meaningful to so many people. Of course, there are literal interpretation of the lyrics, 
but there's also the overarching effect of believing in one's own resilience. And as generations of listeners have listened, the song has continued to take on meaning to so many people. I Will Survive may have been originally written as a B-side track, but it did not take long for it to surpass all expectations. Part of its rise to stardom came from Gloria's own efforts, as she began sharing the song with DJs around New York. After asking a Studio 54 DJ to play the track and seeing the audience immediate reaction, Gloria realized this is a hit song. New York audiences don't immediately love anything. So she gave the DJ a whole stack and encouraged him to share it with his own colleagues. Pretty soon, I Will Survive was a club favorite around New York and then across the country. Released on October the 23rd, 1978, the song entered the Billboard Hot 100 by December. By March of the next year, it had hit number one. It also topped the charts in the UK, Ireland, and Canada. The song received the first and only Grammy given for a best disco record in 1980. Not only was it a hit of the disco era, but it remains one of the most lasting anthems of all time. It carries so much meaning to so many groups and individuals. In 2016, it was chosen by the Library of Congress to be preserved in the National Recording Registry for its cultural, historical, and artistic significance. I mean, this is one of the most powerful songs of all time, one of the most important. I mean, it gets used in movies all of the time because of the lyrical content is unbelievably powerful. It's a really obvious, empowering song for a woman in an abusive um, relationship, and I know that's how many of us see it. However, as you can tell, it was written by somebody who was realizing that they could have a career as a songwriter, and it was then interpreted by an incredible singer, Gloria Gaynor, as a way to empower herself from her having such incredible back pain after having surgery, falling over on stage, and becoming paralyzed. So there's a lot of things coming in there to make this such a powerful song. I've got to be honest, the vocal is incredible, but go back and listen to that string arrangement again, again, and again. The string arrangement is unbelievable. Strings and vocals on that track, so good. I mean, not to take anything away from that, great groove, incredible bass playing, and wonderful guitar playing. What an incredible song. Has it all. And it will be an anthem that will never, ever go away. You hear it all the time on the radio, you see it and hear it, I should say, in every movie you can think of. It is a masterpiece. Thank you everyone involved in making it and thank you everybody for watching. If you have any other ideas for songs down below, please let us know. Um, artist, album, single, you know, you tell us. I love doing this. Thanks ever so much. So long, farewell, lovely design, au revoir, adios, ciao, sayonara, goodbye.